What does being masculine mean to you specifically? Well, that's exactly it. It's just a measurement. It's just mm -hmm. a measurement. It's nothing more than a barometer in the same way an inch is just a measurement. In the same way a foot, a yard is just a measurement. Right? Masculinity is not a thing. So if I was if I was a man and I was and I wanted to explore this more, maybe I'm feeling not masculine enough. Maybe I'm concerned I'm I'm too masculine or I'm I'm toxic masculine. What would you suggest to them would be the steps that they would take to, to be able to explore a healthy masculinity? Again, another great question. In my practice, I like to explore what we call the personal myth. And this is the stories that we tell ourselves about what we believe. See, once it's a belief, it's really hard to challenge because it's not supported by fact usually. It's usually conjecture, feelings, indoctrination, just kind of this Molotov cocktail of influence that we kind of uh, harden into this belief. So for me, let's talk about the stories that you tell yourself about what you believe about masculinity, both the good and the bad. Let's talk about it, let's examine it, and let's change your relationship to these beliefs. If you can change your relationship to these beliefs to where it's a beneficial story, you will usually get a beneficial outcome. What, how do we start weighing benefit? How does it benefit the people around you? How does it benefit you? How does it benefit your family? How does it benefit your job? How does it benefit your income? Right? Because masculinity is just the center of the web in most cases of a man's world. It's about how we navigate our entire existence. So let's change our relationship to the narrative. And eventually the whole thing changes. And that's kind of how I view it. I'm interested to hear your opinion on this because you mentioned that you were in a poly relationship. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I hear a lot from men who, from my audience and, you know, there's, there's, I interview lots of women and men who are in non-monogamous relationships. And the comment that I see so often is that if you are willing to share your woman with another man, um, you are not masculine. You are not a man. You are a simp. You are all of these other things. What would you say to those people who harbor those beliefs? <laughs> I'm surprised that you used that word simp. That was a old... I see it. <laughs> that, that word specifically is on my YouTube channel comments a lot. A That's lot. So interesting. That was an old <laughs> word that we used to use in the 80s. And um, in the early 80s, as a matter of fact, called somebody a simp. It, it's actually an abbreviation for sympathetic. You're overly sympathetic to the words, plights, or emotions of your partner. And here's mm. the thing. I don't think being a simp is actually a problem. I think what it is, is people don't appreciate the care and the tenderness that certain people have. It's not respected by many uh, um, people, and they abuse that openness, that vulnerability that that person has. So I don't think a, a calling someone a simp is really um, a good thing to do. It's just really acknowledging that this person is sensitive and you're taking advantage of it or not appreciating this person for it. If you go by the original definition, right? So if you get a person who like cares about you, wants to do things for you, wants to come over and, and, and you know, make sure you're not starving or, or do some work or lift you out of your circumstances because making you feel good makes him feel good. He derives a sense of pleasure from pleasing you. I don't see why that's a problem. What I see mm -hmm. as a problem is how people treat those people, mm -hmm. right? If you want hyper-masculine, someone who's going to play this game of protectionism, I'm only going to give you what I think you should have. I'm not going to open myself up. I'm not going to be vulnerable. I'm going to keep my finances, my finances, your finances, your finances. I'll have sex with whoever I want, not talk to you about it, not be open about it. You can do the same exact thing. If that's what you term a good relationship, go for it. But just because someone runs contrary to that doesn't mean that they should be treated as weak or subordinate, mm -hmm. or a cuckold. That should look worse on the actual individual who's abusing that person's uh, desire to be in relationship fully, wholly, and mm -hmm. open. Mm -hmm. right. It's interesting that you brought up the word cuckold. There is um, a, a, a fan of mine who, who openly admits 
to being a cuck. And we've had this discussion a couple of times. And he says that, you know, he doesn't understand why people view, you know, cuckolding in such a negative term. He says, for me, I feel like if I have a partner who is so desirable and beautiful and amazing, I want to share her with other people. I want other people to enjoy what I enjoy. He's like, it's like, I think he likened it to having like a great car that like he wants to like share with other people. How, how does that resonate with you? I think that they have a very aggrandized version of what cuckolding is. <laughs> I think they're being, they've romanticized it very much. Um, so first of all, his analogy would be more like, I have a beautiful car and somebody takes it whenever they want to and kind of drives past me to show me that they're using my thing. And I derive a sense of gratification from them mm-hmm. using it whenever they want to and driving it the way, wherever they want to. That's cuckolding. If, if what he sounds like he's describing is being in an open relationship, right? Mm-hmm. Two very different things. We have to separate the fetish of cuckolding or sexual humiliation from possibly what he's thinking of, which is kind of this romanticized version of you know, being in an open relationship with another individual, right? Mm-hmm. You, have to th- you have to remember that there's three criteria for fetish, right? A fetish has something to empower, unempower, or transform. Those are the three main c- categories. So if the fetish is uh, unempowering you or weakening you, and you derive a sense of gratification from it, then it's a fetish, which is what cold holding is. If it's something that empowers you sexually, psychologically, emotionally, or even physically, right? It can be a fetish, especially if it's sexual. And that was what we can maybe talk about dominance, mastery, mistresses, so on and so forth. If it transforms you into a little cat, uh, animal, baby, right? Fetish. Right. If you're talking about being cuckold and it unempowers you, it really t- makes you feel weak, makes you feel humiliated, makes you feel low. Right. Then we can start talking about cuckolding. Right. If mm-hmm. you derive a sense of gratification from that. Otherwise, it's not necessarily cuckolding. Do you think that there is anything inherently problematic with having a fetish like that where you're degraded? and maybe you enjoy being humiliated, do you, do you think that that's a problem for someone or could they have that kind of kink in a healthy fashion? If it's done consciously, then I don't see the problem with it. When both people agree to the terms and parameters, the space, place, time, and sacrifice associated with it, then I feel like it'd be healthy. As a matter of fact, now you get healthy healing, right? Because both are going into this space in the same way a surgeon has to break the skin, cut open the person, reach inside of their body to heal them. Sometimes we have to go into the space where we do a little hurt to get a lot of healing, right? And that's kind of this idea of humiliation. Remember the root word of humiliation is humility, right? Mm -hmm. And anything that can help you develop healthy humility is a good thing. What I often find is, Cuckolding in our society is something that someone did to you. It was not consensual. And that's the negative association that we have with it. I was humiliated by this person and my my wife or my husband was a co-conspirator in the process. I did not consent to this. And it's harmed me. It didn't just hurt. It was harmful. But if two people sit down and have the conversation, I want to be with other people and I want to be with you when you're with, you know, with those other people, I want to see you because it kind of hurts in a good way because I derive a sense of satisfaction from it. Then maybe people can have talk about the benefits and the risks associated with it. And both people can step into a, a way of being with it that feels good to both of them and they can start that journey. Mm 